Okay, we will start our uh, webinar today under the Kix uh, platform. This is our second uh, webinar uh, today. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and uh, gentlemen. And uh, today we have uh, an interesting uh, presentation on a different topic, which is uh, related to alkali activated materials. The title of the talk today is alkali activated material as alternative uh, cementitious binder. And uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Hamad Khalid, who is uh, currently working as assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering uh, department at KFUPM. And uh, uh, he did his master's and uh, PhD from KAIST in Korea and uh, his master's in 2015 and uh, PhD in 2018. So uh, Korea Advanced Institute of uh, Scientific uh, Science and Technology is a very famous uh, institute. Uh, Dr. Hamad Khalid carries out research in the area of smart and uh, innovative uh, concrete uh, technology. Some of the current research topics on which he's working includes construction materials, supplementary cementitious materials, multifunctional simultaneous materials, then also in the structures, structural strengthening using FRPs. And he's also interested in nanomaterials based cementitious and polymeric sensors and energy harvesters. So, uh, today he is going to present uh, on algally activated uh, materials as a cementitious binder. So we welcome you, Dr. Ahmed Khaled. Uh, Please uh, share your screen and start the presentation. So everybody can share my uh, see my screen now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kleem, for the nice introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank the uh, KICS uh, team for providing us with this uh, platform where we can exchange knowledge and interact with our colleagues within uh, the university. So uh, definitely it will it can provide chances to enhance collaboration and do multidisciplinary work. So which is the new like theme of our university. So today I will be talking about alkali activated materials as uh, cementitious uh, binders. So first of all, uh, I will go through uh, the overview of my presentation. Uh, the first thing is the question that uh, why do we need uh, alternative cementitious materials? Uh, wait a second. Let me. I cannot see the Zoom screen. Let me open that screen on my. Okay. So. First thing is that why we need alternative cements. Uh, we have a Portland cement, a traditional cement. We know uh, from many decades, it's working fine. Uh, durability, its properties, everything is good. So why we need new materials? The one thing is, this is the important question. And then what are the activated materials? What type of raw materials we need? Uh, what are the local options we have? And then uh, classifications of alkali activated materials. But then I will uh, share my research, our uh, experience of our research team, and what we do have need to learn more in the future for future establishment of these binders. So first of all, this all this story starts from the greenhouse gas emissions from different uh, different industrial uh, plants, different industrial products, and among uh, many greenhouse gases, uh, CO2 is the major greenhouse gas. And if we look uh, its impact on the environment, so we have this uh, carbon clock uh, made by this uh, institute MMC, MCC in Berlin. So what it shows that if we are emitting uh, this much amount of CO2 uh, every second, this is the approximate uh, quantity worldwide we are emitting uh, today until. So looking at a scenario that too much in two degrees centigrade increase in the temperature. So this is how much amount is left, budget of CO2 is left, and it will take us only 25 years 
to consume this budget and after that we will be at the global environmental temperature of this earth can increase by two degrees centigrade so this is an estimation uh, which is huge in terms of uh, average temperature of earth so we need to take action and what type of actions we have to take we need to re reduce their emissions we need to uh, somehow capture them back from the air we have already emitted so there are many ways we have to work on so if we look at the construction industry or concrete material, which is the main uh, construction material or primary construction material, uh, it has uh, this uh, typical composition. We have aggregates, uh, gravel, you can say. We have sand, a fine aggregate. Then we have cement, which is the main binder in our concrete. This needs water to react with the as, uh, to have a hydration reaction and that's how it gains a strength uh, which we call hydraulic uh, reaction and this is uh, this concrete is the most uh, used material after the water like we consume water we consume food but if we check how much amount we are using of concrete so it is more than food even it is more than food so it's we are using tremendous amount of concrete in which cement is the main binder right so this cement here uh, for its production, we have a process. We need to take certain raw materials. We have to uh, burn them and or heat them in the rotary in the kiln at very high temperature, uh, around 1450 degrees centigrade. And then uh, we need fuels, like burning of, of for these. We need fuels. So if we are using a fuel which is more environmental hazardous, so definitely we are uh, damaging our environment. And we need to look for alternative fuels for uh, greener fuels. So this is one option which we have to address. And the other thing is that the raw materials we use. So the basic raw material for this uh, Portland cement, our normal cement we know of, is a calcium chloride, which is limestone. So during this heating process, this limestone goes through the calcination process. And during that, we emit CO2. So you can see the figures here that roughly for each one kg of uh, calcium carbonate, we are emitting about 44% of CO2. So this is due to the basic chemistry that this is the raw material, necessary raw material to get these binders. And we get uh, emit this CO2 into the environment. So if we do some analysis that how much overall we are emitting to the environment, so then we end up with the figures like around somewhere five to eight percent of global CO2 emissions is solely from the cement production. So this is a big number. So we have to do something to increase uh, to sorry to decrease this emission and this impact on the global uh, scale. So what we can do in this regard? So as I mentioned that there are two ways. Uh, things which are contributing one is the high temperature and the other one is the basically coming from the basic chemistry of basic calcination of the raw material so in terms of high temperature we have done pretty well that we uh, increase the efficiency of our uh, plants cement manufacturing plants by introducing some uh, preheaters some flash furnaces and circular utilization of uh, the emissions from the main kiln that we uh, the heat we can circular utilize this one and we have done quite well in reducing the overall impact and with in the future if we have more greener fuels more greener options for electricity generation so this can be reduced further but in the same time we have to look for other raw materials for other sources like if we can modify the chemistry of portland cement or if there are other types of cements so what we can do? So what we can do, the, so we have to look on this uh, basic uh, chemistry of uh, cements, different classes of cements. So mainly uh, these uh, cements, they have uh, calcium, alumina, and silica components. And this is a scale showing uh, the levels of different uh, cements, like in terms of our normal cement, which is Portland cement. Uh, the calcium contents is on the upper side here. And we have a mid, like on the lower side, we have alumina content. Then we have different options, uh, calcium aluminate cements, sulfur aluminate cements, uh, and alkali activated materials is one of them. 
the issue with aluminate cements is that we need pure sources of alumina and sometimes for calcium also, which are costly. So it will increase. So we end up with having more costly materials. So that's why their acceptance is not at that level. And if we talk about the alkali activated materials, so what are these? These are basically we need some solid precursors and we need to activate them using an alkali source. What are these solid precursors? Most of the time, they are industrial waste byproducts from different industrial uh, productions of different other materials. Like some of them I have listed here, there are many other options available like coal fly ash, uh, slag from different metallurgical processes. This could be blast furnace slag, silico magnesium slag or any other. Then metacholine is one of them and natural pozzolan. These four are the common ones. That's why I have highlighted them in my slide. So we have also have some natural uh, precursors also like natural pozzolan or volcanic ash or natural clays we have. So they can also be used for as a precursor for alkali activation. And we have the common type of activators are sodium or hydroxide. This could be sodium or potassium. And then we need a silicate source uh, because this is needed for the basic chemistry to meet the basic chemistry of uh, cements, we need silica source to gain enough uh, strength. So we need a silicate source as sodium silicate is the most common one we are using. So if we look at these, so what we do, we take solid precursor similar in similar fashion, like we use make our typical concrete. We add water in cement. In this case, we add a clear activator. And then we need proper curing and we get a very solid uh, binder having a good strength which can be used as concrete. So if we try to estimate that what we will gain in terms of CO2 emissions if we choose these materials. So there are different estimations depending on uh, regions, uh, cost of uh, these activators uh, and production efficiency of these activators. And also how efficiently we design the mixture design, like the activator dose, the molarity of NaOH or KOH, then how much silica silicate we are using. So we have a wide range. So there are different estimations reported by different researchers. And we end up with this window here, which is about 40 to 80% reductions we can achieve in terms of CO2 emissions compared to our ordinary Portland cement. So this means that it's a good number that we can, that even if we look at the 40%, still it's a quite a significant figure that we can achieve a 40% reduction. So it means that uh, they are promising materials, but there are other options. I'm not saying that uh, this is the only option. Uh, there are other options also. In fact, I am also working on other alternative winders. So this is one of them we are trying to introduce today in the, uh, this webinar. And this concrete has some, uh, there have been some demonstrations in the field applications, like these are some pictures uh, from two companies, Zeobon and EFC. They are being mainly based in Australia. So they have done some demonstration. Uh, this has been used even for uh, an airport also. This whole airport structure is made using these alkali activated binders. So this shows that they have potential, they are, also at the development stage, uh, like developed stage, and they can be used for applications in the field. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the different classes or different, uh, like little chemistry of the alkali activated binders. So here we have uh, calcium content, here we have alumina content, and this is a big window we have. So depending on the composition of raw materials, like whether they have higher calcium, lower calcium, or moderate levels, and what type of activator we are using, we can identify or we can classify these binders into different classes. Like if our binder has higher level of calcium, so we have high calcium binders, we have low calcium binders, uh, normally, we refer them in the different papers. You might see that if we use the terminology geopolymers, they are mainly belongs to the low calcium binders. And the precursors for them are metacholine, class F fly ash, or different clays, which 
have higher or lower level of calcium. And then we also have some blended systems where we can blend these two types like higher level of calcium or low level of calcium and we can blend them in certain uh, composition and we end up with having a blended systems. So I will talk briefly about, uh, about this, why we need this on the coming slides that why we need blended sy uh, systems or what are the benefits or drawbacks of each of these high and low calcium. So before, before going to that uh, part, uh, let me explain a little bit about the basic chemistry uh, about these materials. We need, uh, we get solid uh, precursor and then we add uh, activation solution. So mainly the role of the activating solution is that to act as a catalyst because only water is not enough uh, for these materials. Uh, and we need an activator and a catalyst to speed up and to increase the reactivity of these binders, these raw materials precursors. So when we add activator, this they dissolute these materials in the solution. And then this reaction starts and we have this gel nucleation phase, which is basically the main, you can say, strengthening component of cement. So if we talk about normal Portland cement, uh, you might be familiar with the term uh, calcium silicate hydrate. I assume that some of the uh, participants are from other departments, uh, from other backgrounds. So for typically in Portland cement, uh, we add water and uh, one what we get is calcium silicate hydrate. This is basically, we call it CSH gel. And this is the main strengthening ingredient of, you can, uh, of our cement binder. In similar fashion, we also get calcium silicate hydrate in high calcium systems because calcium is still dominating. So that's why calcium silicate hydrate, but it's a little different from the Portland cement. And why is that? Because here we also have higher levels of alumina present. So it will be substituted with the alumina and we have, we call it aluminum substituted calcium silicate hydrate, or in other words, we use this terminology cash. Compared to high calcium, if we look at the low calcium systems, so low calcium systems, the main cation is not calcium. It is the cation which is coming from the activator. And in activator, we can have sodium, we can have potassium. These are the two main cations we are using. So we have sodium or potassium aluminum silicate hydrate and we represent it either with NASH or CASH, you can call again. And these are the main uh, products, the main binding or strengthening phases of these materials. Definitely we have some secondary products also. One of them is crystalline uh, zeolites. They are also aluminosilicate materials and uh, they are crystalline. They don't have that much strength contribution. And if we see about uh, the alum silica, alumina, and calcium composition of different uh, systems, so these uh, blue dots are representing that how much uh, we is they are used made using fly ash only. And if our fly ash has higher alumina content, or our uh, then we might be having Nash, which is rich in silica and if it has uh, this our fly ash has higher alumina content then we might have aluminum rich nash so we will be on this side of the picture and if we talk see about the high calcium systems so their chemistry will be somewhere here like we will have more calcium uh, more alumina and also uh, so this silica will be at this levels and then we can have a blended systems where we can achieve the chemistry somewhere in between these two. And why we need that? Because here, let me talk about a little bit further that here, uh, we have some issues with the low calcium and high calcium systems. Low calcium systems, they uh, need some heat, heat curing for gaining strength. And on, in opposite high calcium systems, they have some issues with rapid setting, some high shrinkages. So what we do, like if we combine these systems so we can compensate, compensate the drawbacks of each of these, and ultimately we end up with uh, relatively acceptable values in terms of setting time, in terms of 
uh, curing uh, we need. So that's why we have these blended systems. So before going any further, so let's have a look. What are the potential candidates for precursors here in our uh, in this region of a kingdom we have? So we have natural pozzolan reserve in the western region, in volcanic ash. It is available there in abundance. Uh, there have been some studies also about utilization of these for alkali activated binders. Then we have a uh, clays, mainly Colin clays in Kharj area and Braida and in Al Katif region, that they, they are also a potential candidate. Then we have uh, metallurgical slags also. So this is just an estimate figure I got from uh, one website from Sabic. They are producing annually around uh, this much, uh, 350,000 tons of uh, slag, steel slag. Then there is another type of slag. This is silico manganese slag. This slag comes from silico manganese alloy, which is needed for, again, for steel manufacturing. So this is another type. And then there is a new type, relatively new, because uh, with, within the last four to five years, we have few uh, publications coming up on th this type of uh, material, like this is silico manganese fume. Uh, both of these, this SMS and this SMF, both of these, they come from the same uh, process. A slag is basically more solid, more particle, particle size is big, and fumes are what we capture from the flying fumes. That's why we call it fumes for very tiny particles we are talking about. So now, since I have explained like what are alkali activities, so I hope that you have an idea that what are these, uh, what type of materials we need, uh, what are the local options we have. So uh, now I would like to talk a little bit about our personal experiences, our personal studies by our research team. So if we talk about uh, slag, the setting, I already mentioned earlier that slag is a high calcium precursor. And high calcium precursors, specifically the slag, they have high rapid setting issues. So this chart here is showing that if we use different activators and at different ambient temperatures, so the setting time with this one here, which is uh, the limit, this is the minimum time we need to, uh, to handle the concrete. Oh, sorry, I think I placed it by mistake here. It should be here. So this is like a one hour setting time. So I made this mistake, sorry for that. So this is the minimum we need that we mix the concrete, then we have to bring it to the side, then we have to place it. So for that, do, do these tasks, we need some time, right? So this is the minimum time we need, which is one hour. And if you look at this picture that we have, uh, most of the slags, their initial setting time is less than this. So which is an issue that how we can uh, increase the setting time. So people have used a different uh, activator, uh, super plasticizers or retarders. But the issue is that since we are using alkali activator in these systems, which is highly alkaline, and when we add any traditional admixture or any chemical to increase the setting time, the activator plays with this chemistry and at the end we find that they are not uh, functioning because the activator will change will decrease their efficiency and we most of the time we get nothing and then there was one study that sodium chloride was used and setting time was extended but uh, when the compression strength was checked it came out to be only three megapascal so it means that maybe it totally uh, inhibited the reactivity and that's why the strength was too low. So what we tried, we basically did some surface modification of our slag. We used water or NOH, two different types of modifying solutions, one molarity NOH solution and water, normal tap water. And basically we got this idea due to the weathering of normal Portland cement. So norm, our normal Portland cement, it, if we don't store it properly, it can partially hydrate, it can have carbonation. So that's why we use uh, these uh, those modifying agents to try to modify uh, the surface by prehydration uh, of by using these modifying solution. 
and then for carbonation we did the carbonation in the carbonation chamber this in under controlled environment so and we did three different types of techniques we used first thing is we just took the slag we put it in the carbonation and we did the modification for certain amount of time in three days uh, seven days and 14 days and then the second type we separate a specific amount of water on our slag and then we put it again under the same environment carbonation and lastly the noh in the same fashion and then we did some uh, characterizations for uh, understand the chemistry what actually happened and also definitely we studied the flow properties and the setting time properties so let's have a look here that what we achieved by doing this so when we separated water or noh basically we this noh will react with this calcium which was initially inside the slag when it came to interact with the calcium inside the slag it force it to leach out of or and come on the outer surface, which can then react with the atmospheric carbonate, uh, the CO2. In our case, the, uh, we had a controlled environment and we got this calcium carbonate eventually. So by it doing this, ultimately what we can do or what we can achieve that this exposed area of the particle was decreased because there were already some products so exposed area is less since exposed area is less so reaction speed will decrease and ultimately we might end up having a good setting time and when we checked the setting time and uh, flow loss so we got very good promising results and here are those results here that a uh, flow in millimeters is shown that compared to the control sample here which is uh, a purple line you can see uh, the control sample within 20 minutes it lost its so flowability and the setting happened i can we can say but compared to this uh, the carbonated samples and the treated samples uh, this one here is showing that three day carbonation seven day carbonation 14 days uh, 14 days with water modification 14 days with uh, solution this uh, alkali solution modification so this black one you see this seems uh, came out to be the best one that we uh, this flow loss was very you can say smooth and we got enough time in terms of handling the concrete on the site and the setting time which is minimum required is 60 minutes so our initial setting time i'm talking about uh, here you see this control sample had uh, 40 minutes only and then after three days there was no significant change same but as soon as we increase the carbonation to seven days and 14 days, we got very good results. And all these samples, they showed us they were above the min minimum acceptable criteria for the setting time. So we got very uh, promising results from this study. Uh, but let me tell one thing here, state one thing here is that once we are talking about consuming some of the products of uh, calcium uh, the slag uh, before the proper hydration uh, before the proper uh, reaction so this might affect the compressive strength also so we checked the compressive strength uh, we saw some decrease but it is also within very acceptable limits limits like you see we have this error of margin this is our control samples seven days and 28 days so compared to these two samples, our other samples, specifically these four samples, which were meeting the initial setting time criteria, they did quite well. And the reduction is not that much significant. So it's also a good uh, finding that compressive strength is also good, acceptable. Then uh, after I joined KFUPM in 2019, as Dr. Kaleem already mentioned in the introduction, so I got a chance to work with one of our colleagues, uh, Professor Shamshad. Uh, he was working on a project, so I played some role and I also in he like invited me to participate. So thanks to him that I was part of this uh, study. So we used uh, this locally available natural pozzolan in the kingdom in the western region as the primary binder to make 
alkali activated materials and we studied uh, two types of active alkali hydroxide we used uh, sodium hydroxide potassium hydroxide and also uh, since we use sodium silicate is an essential part of the activator so we also try to investigate the effect of its uh, content uh, sodium silicate to alkali hydroxide ratios so more specifically we tried uh, these three ratios 4 uh, 2.5 and 1 two different types of alkali hydroxides and then we also tried three different levels or contents of natural phobolon which was our a primary binder 100 percent 90 percent and 85 percent and the secondary binder was we made it as a secondary binder or our portland cement as 10 percent and 15 percent so after uh, the activation and the curing of for uh, seven days uh, this is what uh, we achieved the in terms of compressive strength uh, since uh, let me explain a little bit about the composition what does this mean uh, ss over ph sodium silicate stands for ss and this h for hydroxide uh, p for potassium hydroxide and this s here is for sodium hydroxide so we have potassium series here and sodium series on the left side and then as since we discussed uh, investigated uh, different levels of sodium silicate so starting from 1 2.5 and uh, 4 and same here so you can see that as uh, this percent ratio of uh, this sodium silicate to hydroxide increased in both the cases we saw this type of trend that strength also increased and generally our NUH series compared to KH series showed higher strength uh, with respect to KH series there with, if we compare the respective samples with other parameters fixed so NUH series performed better and the main reason for this one is that uh, by default sodium hydroxide is uh, more its dissolution of the ingredients of the precursor is better in this solution and that's why this came out to be the a better option compared to KOH. And then lastly, uh, as we substituted some of the NP with the OPC, strength also increased this way. Like here one, we have 100% NP, 90% and 85%. So, and it was expected because we had the system, we when we add some of the Portland cement, so since alkali activator has some water also, so it will cause some secondary hydration of the Portland cement and ultimately we will, we can have higher strength also. So this is what we achieved, uh, we saw in this study. And then after the detailed uh, com compressive strength uh, study, we chose uh, four samples out of these, uh, four best samples in each of these series, uh, namely, this one, uh, because our SS to hydroxide ratio four was performing best in each of these series. So we chose this series, uh, this one combination. And among this, 100% NP and 85%, 100% NP and 85%. So these four samples we selected, and then we further investigated uh, the other mechanical properties like uh, separating tensile strength, modulus of velocity you see on the right side. Uh, this separating tensile strength was uh, you can say norm in normal range uh, compared to the Portland cement concrete but interestingly if you have a look here in this one all both of these samples which had 100 percent np although they were showing a very uh, good compressive strength uh, 28 which is a uh, good strength in terms of structural concrete uh, may we need minimum 20 per uh, 20 megapascal so they were meeting the that criteria but in terms of uh, stiffness they did not well so their strength was quite uh, modulus of elasticity was quite low which should be somewhere around 20 or even more than that so this told us that uh, although we could achieve good compressive strength but there are other properties we have to check and in terms of 100 percent np their modulus of elasticity was not good but for 85% uh, percent NP with 15% percent Portland cement, we got very good results. Uh, we got 20 and 
28 uh, gigapascal modulus velocity. So it means that uh, we have to do further investigation that why this matrix is giving us low stiffness, even though the strength is uh, good enough. Uh, then we also checked uh, shrinkage properties because uh, shrinkage is a big uh, criteria, important criteria for any surface uh, serviceable concrete. So we compared our values with the standard rec recommended values like 28 days shrinkage should be less than a 500 micro strain. And luckily uh, we got that this all the values were less than the maximum permissible limit. So it means that we are on this, doing good until this point. And then we also checked the durability characteristics like uh, their resistance against uh, heating exposure and their resistance against uh, acidic exposure. So this chart here is showing the heating exposure and the bottom one is showing the acid exposure. So, and here we have residual strength right after exposing to the heat or acid, how much strength will reduce. So this is what we got that uh, for different samples, the variation was uh, different that we got 82% or 71%, 90 or 76%. And if we compare these values to Portland cement, so they are very much uh, comparable, I can say. So in terms of this also, it is it was doing fine. But in terms of modulus of elasticity, uh, it, it, did not, it did not perform well. So we have to investigate that wow, further that why this happened and how we can address this issue. Okay, so uh, thanks to Dr. Kaleem that he mentioned that I am also working on functional uh, cements or functional binders uh, because uh, this was one of the topic I wanted to explain today. Uh, apart from the structural applications of alkali activated materials, they have a very good potential for different functional applications. And one of them we try to investigate in our study that specifically these low calcium alkali activated binders. Uh, you might remember that when I showed the reaction, I, I mentioned that we have this Nash type gel in low calcium activated uh, binders. So this gel is basically aluminosilicate gel. And with this gel, the secondary product was a zeolite. Zeolite is also aluminosilicate material, but it's crystalline. They have defi definite ordering and uh, of these uh, group um, bonds. That's why they have a high porosity, high surface area. And due to these reasons, they have many industrial applications as surfactants, as adsorbents of, uh, of pollutants like heavy metals or radionuclides. So what we did basically in this study, we tried to utilize uh, the reaction chemistry here that if when we activate the solution, what we get, we get a dissolution of uh, our species in the solution, and then we get the polymerization. This is the typical route. We get the polymerization and we end up with a morphous gel, which is strong. And that's why we have a strong strength. But in parallel, some, some part of this will nucleate and that will end up with having crystalline phases. And that's a typical uh, byproduct or secondary product of any low calcium alkali activated material. So what we can do here is that we, if we put these materials under certain high temperature and pressure conditions, and why is that? Uh, like the industrial level of manufacturing of zeolites from pure chemicals, alumina and silica chemicals, uh, this high temperature and high pressure uh, processing is the main thing or more main process to prepare any different types of type of zeolite. And we call this hydrothermal treatment. So we saw that if we apply the same hydrothermal treatment to our material, we might be able to transform some of this gel, which is having very similar chemistry to crystalline form and we will, might end up having more surface area so that we can possibly utilize these materials for adsorption applications also. But what we will gain from this is that most of these adsorbents, zeolite adsorbents, they are in a powder form and we, uh, if we want to use them in adsorption columns, uh, 
So someone, if someone in the presentation here is from the environmental background, so they might understand better that we need to, if we want them in the bulk form, we we sometimes we use some binders to uh, bind these uh, zeolites or other type of adsorbents, and then we have those spherical or beads type shapes, and then we can use them in the uh, call in columns because. Uh, using powder and uh, then capturing it back in the industry uh, is also uh, one of the issues. So here what we can achieve, these materials by default, they have high strength, they are solid, they have any block shape, you can achieve any shape uh, in whichever mold you put in, they will get that shape. And if we can increase their surface area, increase their potential uh, for uh, different applications, so we can also have some environmental benefit from these. So this is what we tried to achieve in our study. We used the precursor materials, fly ash, slag, an activator. And then after mixing, we put them under hydrothermal conditions in a closed chamber. This is just the top view of the picture. And after that, we closed it. And then we put it in the oven at high temperature. And due to high temperature, it will create high pressure also because we will put some we had to put some water also inside which will make vapor then it's something like a pressure cooker like we put some water heat it and then it will in increase the pressure and that pressure will help in increasing uh, shaping the material into crystalline shape and increasing the surface area and everything so by doing this we achieved what we targeted that uh, Normally, we have amorphous content, but in this case, if you see, have a look at this XRD, especially in this region, we got these very sharp peaks uh, belonging to zeolite type NAP1. And this is a common type of zeolite, which we which is synthesized in, in industry and used for different adsorption applications. So this is the main uh, zeolite component or zeolite phase we got after this treatment. And we also did some SEM analysis to study the morphology and to confirm that they are uh, zeolite pre-crystals. So, and this is a typical uh, morphology of zeolite pre-crystals and we saw very uh, fine uh, crystals in the SEM images. And then after confirming that this is zeolite P, we did adsorption tests and we used uh, lead uh, as our pollutant. And these were the adsorption parameters, the concentration, the pH of the solution, and the contact time and for different samples i will not go into the details of these what are these parameters because here we just want to look uh, what we achieved ultimately how much maximum capacity we achieved so in terms of capacity this is the maximum capacity we achieved which is around 38 uh, milligram per gram of material now this one might seem uh, less if we compare it to other commercial adsorbents because some commercial adsorbents they have 100 or 200 or even more okay but if we compare them with the uh, solid form block shaped uh, materials or adsorbents then this is quite uh, good and uh, very promising that we can use them but here again we saw one issue we figured out this one issue that for, to achieve this value we need to wait for 120 hours, like almost five days, we have to wait for this adsorption. Typically, adsorption experiments are for a few minutes or maximum few hours, but we had to wait for 120 hours, five days. So we just tried to check that whether they have less capacity, less speed, or is it due to the shape of the block? Like if, because we have block and the ions have to diffuse the penetrate inside, so we take the same samples uh, and then we crush them and we did the, repeated the experiments, one with the pulverized samples, uh, powder samples, and one with the solid samples. And this is what we saw that for pulverized samples, the absorption was very quick. And for solid samples, it took again a reasonable amount of time and we could achieve 90% after 24 hours and then it slowly increased to like 90% or 7%, you can say, adsorption. So this is a thing we need to address that how we can increase uh, their speed. So we are working on, on this also in our project. One project is going on and we are trying to enhance this speed so that 
uh, we will get good absorption at a reasonable amount of time. So this is due to the slow diffusion mainly because bulk. So if we increase the diffusion somehow, we might have, we can increase this or we can shift this curve towards the higher end. So this is what we did in this work. And now I would like to summarize, or I would like to highlight that what we have to do next. So we, there are a great amount of work has been done. Different researchers from different parts of the world are working on different binders, precursors, and trying to optimize the mixed proportions. But until now, there is no standard like we have standards for Portland cements. So we need to work on the binder design. What type of, depending on the binder, we have to find suitable activators, how we can regulate the workability or rheology. And we might have to look for a different class of admixtures because typical admixtures, they don't work due to the high pH of the so environmental solution of the mixture there. And then we have to do an environmental assessment also because if we unnecessarily use higher amount of activator, specifically sodium silicate, we might end up uh, like emitting more CO2 compared to normal Portland cement. So this thing should be optimized. We have to use the required amount of activator and we have to do some uh, specific case studies to figure out that. And we, it's good if we have an inventory database uh, unified where we can compare our work with uh, anyone working in other part of the world. So that would be a good way to uh, move towards a standardization of these uh, materials. So that was all from my side. Thank you for your patience and listening to my presentation. Uh, I would like to hear from the questions from your side now. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice and interesting uh, presentation, Dr. Hamad. And uh, um, this was our second presentation at the IRC for construction and uh, building materials. Um, and this new center is really uh, progressing at a fast pace in different research activities. And uh, this presentation highlighted uh, a multidisciplinary theme. Also, we're working on environmental engineering and uh, concrete engineering was uh, presented. And uh, the research were also um, highlighted in this particular area of alkali activation of concrete. So with this, uh, let's uh, come to Q&A. And uh, right now I have only one question and we can start from that. Uh, generally, if you could put in your question in the chat and the Q&A box, and we will answer it. And uh, if you want to raise your hand, and ask a particular question, then uh, raise your hand and ask uh, a question. So let's start with the first question. Uh, Mr. Mohammed Balogun is asking, apart, apart from being environment friendly, does AAM result in a reduced cost when compared with cement? A reduced cost, uh, this is a question which depends on relativity, I can say. So if you are getting your, your precursors uh, locally, if you have your precursors, uh, and that's why I have one slide about locally available precursors, uh, because uh, the common precursors like uh, fly ash is one of them. If we take the scenario of uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, we don't burn coal here to produce electricity and we don't have fly ash here. So if we are importing the fly ash from some other country like uh, China or India, then definitely the import cost will add. So ultimate, so we might end up having more cost. But if you have lo locally sourced materials, like if you go for natural pozzolan or some metacolin clay or some slag from the steel manufacturing, as I mentioned, so then definitely those materials uh, they will cost lesser than the OPC, and we might have some reduction in the cost as well. But this cost might be compensated by uh, the higher cost of the alkali activators, right? So then we, that's why I mentioned that we have to design uh, efficiently that because alkali activators, uh, they will 
cost anyway. So in if we are reducing the precursor cost and we are increasing the activator's cost, so we have to find a good balance. Uh, we might end up having a little higher cost or same cost. Okay. Tell another question comes in. I mean, uh, uh, let me ask you that uh, uh, this uh, is this material which is now being investigated for more than 10 years. I mean, I think that uh, practically uh, it is feasible to use it in the structures or without any norms and standards, uh, it will be difficult to use uh, alkali activated concrete in the structures. Actually, for industrial acceptance, uh, you know, standardization is uh, very essential and important. And uh, that's what different uh, committees are doing now. Uh, RILAM is uh, one of the association, uh, concrete association in Europe. They are working very well in this regard. They have uh, made many committees uh, for standardization of distance, uh, different testing and of uh, alkali activated materials. So as the more, more standards will come into the market, so the confidence of the contractors or the industry uh, will also increase. So we might see more applications in the future. Well, there, for now, there have been few demonstrations, but uh, definitely the more the standards will be there, more confidence it will gain, and we will have more applications, hopefully. I think so, Muhammad Shami. Question, so I allowed you to talk. Can you ask your question and mute yourself? Muhammad Shami. Okay, in the meantime, as you join no. us, uh, yes, yeah, he, he is unmuted now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, can this be can this type of concrete uh, be used? Uh, can 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 we use for mass production or is it uh, uh, particularly confined to precast industry? No, no, it is not confined to precast only. We can use it for mass production also, uh, but the, this depends on uh, the volume we have. Uh, actually, we are relying on the sources. If we are totally relying on the industrial waste resources, then we have limitations, like in terms of how much resources we have, right? So that's one thing. But if you talk about the chemistry, the reaction, then we can use it for uh, normal construction also. But if you want to use uh, only fly ash activated material, then that which requires a high occurring uh, temperature, then definitely we cannot use it directly. But if we have a blended system like with slag, then normal temperature curing is fine. So then we can use it for uh, mass concreting also. Okay, so let's have another question from uh, uh, Baba Tunde Salami. Uh, sodium hydroxide and sodium silicate have been reported to emit 1.1 and 1.2 kg of carbon dioxide per uh, kilogram of material during production. The question is uh, how 40 to 80 percent reduction is possible for AAC or AAM uh, as compared to OPC when there is uh, only 1 kg of uh, carbon dioxide emitted uh, uh, in cement production. So in cement production, uh, we are reducing, let's say we are totally replacing the cement uh, precursor with the industry, with the a natural material, which does not require high temperature calcination. And uh, during its, even if its calcination is there, then during the decomposition, we are, we are not emitting CO2 directly. So this is one thing that from that side, we are reducing. Uh, from the other side, he's very right that if we don't uh, design efficiently, like if we use a higher amount of uh, sodium hydroxide, higher amount of uh, sodium silicate, then definitely we will end up having more CO2 impact. And this has been reported as well that some studies, they did some analysis for in terms of CO2 uh, uh, footprint. And these uh, such figures have been reported that alkali activated materials ended up giving more CO2. But on the extremes other side, if we are designing these materials efficiently, like we have to use uh, the required amount of activator and right amount of activator, not unnecessarily higher amount of activator, specifically sodium silicate, because sodium silicate is CO2 impact is uh, higher, much higher than sodium hydroxide. 
So if we decrease the sodium silicate uh, quantity in our act activator, we can end up with this uh, these uh, figures. And let me uh, mention here, these figures are estimations by different independent researchers. Uh, that's why we have a big window, like 40 to 80 percent. So, and yeah. I also mentioned that even if we look on the 40 percent only, or even let's say we look for the 30 percent, let's say, or even 20 percent. So, we are talking about a big industry, and this 20 or 30 percent decrease will also end up with a significant uh, decrease. Sorry. So, this is what we are talking about. So, I hope uh, I have answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. So our next, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Usta, our director of IRCCBM, has a question. Yeah. And he has some comments also. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for all of you. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you for attending this uh, very nice presentation and webinar. Uh, actually, the topics today and the previous topic, they are part of our research area in the center. We are going to do a lot of work in this area, inshallah. Uh, I don't have any question rather than to thank Dr. Kaleem for his uh, effort for, uh, and for uh, Dr. Uh, Hamad. For thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for all of you. And uh, that's it. Thank Ask you, him some tough question. <laughs> Ask him some tough question. No, no. We are here to acknowledge everybody. We have to, we are here to thank everybody, Dr. Okay. And Mohammed Shamim has another question. How is uh, the corrosion resistance offered by alkali activated concrete as compared to the normal concrete? Okay, this is a very interesting question, I can say. In yes. our conventional concrete, uh, we have a calcium hydroxide, right? Mm -hmm. This calcium hydroxide is the prod one of the main products of hydration of cement, and this which makes a passive layer on the steel, and then we can have a protection uh, due to this calcium hydroxide. Uh, such protection layer is not there in act alkali activated materials, but in terms of their pH, they also have high pH because we are using alkali activators by default. Mm -hmm. So they also have high pH. So it's not similar to OPC, but they also yeah. have higher pH. And if they also, if we can also ensure uh, less permeability, so they can equally do good in terms of corrosion also. Because a binder part is to stop uh, the, the chloride outside. So if we can make a less permeable material, then we can, and we are successfully stopping chloride outside, then definitely we can have good corrosion protection also. Okay. And uh, I don't have uh, any further question until somebody wants to have any comment. Uh, uh, he may raise his hand and uh, uh, make a comment. So there is one question I think in the chat. I can see, do in conventional chat, binders have certain advantages over alkali activated materials. Yeah. So, a, yeah, yes, yes. So this is also a very good, uh, good question that conventional binders are being used in the industry for many decades. So no matter we try, we are trying hard to look at different alternatives, but we cannot completely like uh, exclude the OPC out of the picture. And the main reason for that is uh, the demand, the global demand and the resources available. So looking at the global demand and the sources of other alternatives available, we still have to use OPC somehow in blended systems uh, or solely depending on the availability of other alternatives. So this is one thing. Advantage is that in terms of uh, strength uh, properties, durability properties, a different uh, materials, they are doing quite reasonably well comparable to uh, our traditional systems. But if we are talking about alkali activators, uh, these materials specifically, so here one advantage or uh, disadvantage or one concern could be that we need to take more, like we have to handle more carefully these materials because we are talking about alkali activators. So it's not water. So in typical binders, we are 
we can easily use like add water and uh, we don't have to take that much care but in this case because it's a chemical it can uh, it can be hazardous also so we have to be carefully uh, use it but let me add one more thing here is that once we mix the activator with the concrete with our binder after mixing then the ph of this material and the ph of our opc blend after a few minutes of mixing and some reaction has happened their ph levels will be very much comparable because there we will also have uh, calcium hydroxide as an alkali and here we have alkalis so we need care initially we need some special you can say uh, care we have to procedures might we have to adopt in the industry but once they are mixed hydration uh, reaction has started then they will become quite similar with each other so can we have a batching plan for this aac it's good that if we uh, can have uh, make it under controlled environment uh, un compared to like uh, in the on the site because it will be a con more controlled production so better quality we can achieve yeah so actually the topic is so interesting because you know it has been a dream of uh, civil engineers to have a, a cement less concrete and uh, this is where we are uh, cement less concrete which is an alkali activated concrete without cement and uh, at uh, kfu pmi or ccbm uh, there are several people who are engaged in uh, uh, working in uh, alkali activated concrete area uh, dr mohammad ibrahim uh, yes yes sir uh, baba tundas lami and uh, uh, i think uh, engineer rizwan also work and actually all these locally available uh, precursors mm -hmm. uh, they have most of the our colleagues from ri and some from our department also uh, they have uh, done this work on alkali activated materials using these locally available precursors so they have done all of them have done a good uh, amount of work in all with all these materials and uh, not to mention I forget to mention dr najam Uh, yes yes uh, this silico magnesium uh, this film. Is, yes, yes. and of course uh, dr masladdin has been advising yes, yes. under his guidance people in this work and, uh, and i also finished recently one of the students in masters with uh, alkali activated concrete yes yes exactly it's a big area uh, i yeah, think yeah, so our like, center uh, we need uh, optimization otherwise uh, we might end up having So with that, I think so. Uh, we uh, come to an end, and uh, we'd like to thank uh, the director of the center for IRC CBM uh, for uh, this uh, arranging uh, this uh, monthly webinars. You know, uh, which will really uh, uh, inform the community over here in KFUPM and our students and our uh, other faculty members of the research which is uh, being. undertaken in the IRC CBM thank you very much to the speaker for a very nice presentation thank, thank you for the invitation and uh, with that we will come to an end uh, to this uh, webinar and hopefully we will see you in another webinar in next month on another very interesting uh, topic so sure. bye for now Start. thank you thank you everyone for attending this uh, presentation thank you